I mean, there was a staging, there was a lighting, there was a voting, there was the... <laughs> Good night, one party people. My name is Fernand, and this is my live show show. Taking a creative kaike after the Sherman at all things live and big shiny TV. Oh, you didn't like to speak Dutch? <laughs> I don't. A what? After two long years of the pandemic absolutely changing the world, the long awaited, Sally postponed, but back in the flesh, biggest TV show in the world came back to our screens. The good thing about Full Start sometimes is that one can come back bigger better and even more awe-inspiring than ever before. I mean, there was a staging, there was a lighting, there was a voting, there was the... the <laughs> I don't know what to say. So many. Oh yeah, sidebar. Little old me, a whole me, made an appearance in the BBC's coverage of this year's Eurovision. To check me out in action, click up here. And I must say, I make a Malta Buona winning prediction. Anywho, the Eurovision Song Contest 2021 makes a grand return. 731 days, two years to the day since the grand final in 2019 in Tel Aviv. In many ways, keeping the same blueprint used for 2020, Glorious Rotterdam retained host city status. The same four hosts of Ed Celia, Chantal, Jan and Nikki now promoted to main host. The same tagline and same-ish logo art. We'll get to this. And with many sames there being many differences, all need to help the show adapt to this new normal of safety being paramount. And the result? An absolute jaw dropper of a production that will certainly go down in history as one of the best contests in recent years, especially given the odds, and also formed a glitzy way for the Dutch government to help examine COVID safe events. Who says you can't have a bit of fun while doing a bit of research? Being the biggest television event in the world, you know it's absolutely chock full to the brim full of facts and figures. But I'm going to keep it to 12. Just 12. Well, 10, but... Well, here's 12 top points of the Eurovision Song Contest 2021 and how it was made. Things you may have not known in numbers. One point. 24 cameras this year, with three of them equipped for usage of augmented reality. Two points. This arena, the Ahoy, has hosted the Eurovision on two occasions. This year, and of course in 2007, for the Junior Eurovision Song Contest. Three points. Three broadcasters this year working together as one. That's NPO, NOS and Avrotros. 4,000. That's the number of separate vision cuts during the live shows undertaken by Qpilot, the live multi-camera switcher. With Finland having over 100 shots in the performance alone. Five points. Nine big shiny expensive OB vans. UHD 1 and 2, the TOC, which is the Technical Operations Center, Music 1, NL6, NL9, and three utility trucks. Six points. There's a whopping 37,369,344 pixels this year, with 21.9 million of pixels just for the wall, and 15,391,000 for the floor. One Ukraine, two Russia, Germany three, Ireland four, Greece five, Lithuania six, Finland seven points. Including the three live broadcasts, there are 12 run-throughs in total. For each show, there's two rehearsals the previous day and one more on the day of the recording. Eight points from Spain go to... That's suspense, Spain! It's a very heavy setup with 285 tonnes of equipment hanging from the roof. And there's 1,780 light fixtures this year, one of the lowest numbers in recent Eurovision times. It's true. And t 10 points? You can never have enough fixie tape, as this year used 81.6 kilometres of gaffer tape. For context, that's the distance between London's Westminster Bridge and Cambridge. And finally... And finally... Our 12 points go to... Ya Ya Ding Dong! Play it! Zero. No Poir was awarded to four countries this year, including the host country Netherlands, and this also affects the UK, who are the first to receive zero from the jury and the televote. Quite interesting having the big 12 points, bookending the other extreme of things. No Poir. So with all that aside, let's open up again to how the show was made. When plans were greenlit to bring the contest back, Decisions were made to make sure that as much of the plans for 2020 was used, with of course some necessary adaptations and changes. Of the four scenarios created to host the contest, confirmation was an option B, meaning close to a full show as possible, and confirmation of the audience a mere month before showtime. 
there are plenty of shiny new additions and changes. A refreshed logo to reinforce the slogan of opening up, welcoming people back into the country and it being a clever way of Rotterdam being the epicentre of this musical extravaganza this May. New singing rules include the pre-recorded vocals allowed for the very first time as backing only. Lead vocals, of course, must remain live. This takes us to the very strict sound and mic management used for the show, but we'll get to this later. And every plan needs a plan B. This plan B being the live on tape option. All participants had to tape and provide a performance. This provided a backup plan for performers to ensure that the entry was broadcast. In this instance, Australia were the first country to implement this rule due to Australian travel restrictions. And eventually the big crowd favorite Iceland had to do the same, albeit differently. With an unfortunate positive result and the whole band withdrawing from the live shows, they relied on their flawless second rehearsal to use as their live on tape performance. Speaking of COVID, a rule was in place to make sure that every single person on site was tested every 48 hours, the result of which was embedded in the accreditation pass. This of course meant that you had to be tested every 48 hours, because if you didn't... Pete says no. All social events for this year's Eurovision was cancelled. No Euroclub, no Eurocafe, or the famous Eurovision Village, with the exception of the turquoise carpet being the only in-person event outside of the live shows for the show itself. The thousands of accredited fans and press that would make their yearly pilgrimage to the Eurovision Mecca was curtailed to just the essentials, with an extensive online offering instead. Pre-show visualisation was heavily implemented in this year's contest, with this year being notable that performances in full were pre-programmed from lighting, pyro and camera angles, this enabling a full look and feel of performances before delegates even landed in Rotterdam. Show production teams used a system called Capture 3D, setting up shop and taking two months of preparation before the live shows itself, which allowed production designers to pre-program the performance ahead of time, and working with the head camera director to provide descriptive camera angles. This, along with stand-ins from local arts colleges in Rotterdam, provided delegations an insight into making the performance dreams come true. So once to set foot in the arena, maximum efficiency with a very tight hour and a half rehearsal time was achieved. Oh, and this event was also earmarked by the Dutch government for them to research a safe way of putting on huge events with audiences safely. A collaboration with the event sector called Field Lab allowed Eurovision to put on the event with 3,500 people in attendance for each of the live shows. And with nearly 30,000 people attending, it was reported that less than 50 of them actually contracted COVID, which gives some hope to managing the events industry. Okay, enough about talking about the blueprint of things, let's talk about how they made all of this a reality. Functional, understated and very Dutch design were the words spoken by set designer Florian Vida, this being his seventh Eurovision assignment. A huge wide open space inspired by Rotterdam's flat horizons with stage wings linking to the canals and bridges of the city. This is flanked by a gigantic LED wall, 170 foot long, 40 foot high and it doesn't get much more Eurovision than with a central portion that splits and swivels a full 180 degrees. And what do you do with the back of a door? Throw some lights on it, with 70 light fixtures per door, which also on the flip side have a mirror that also reflects light, which is pretty cool, to deliver some incredible glittery effects. Clean straight lines and a pseudo minimalistic design providing a massive canvas makes this one of my favourite Eurovision sets in recent years. In true Eurovision style, the satellite stage and the catwalk make a grand return this year, and special thought was decided to make sure that this was its own unique performance space and not just an afterthought. How? with occlusion of a very nifty part transparent LED structure that's flown from the arena ceiling. Part transparent as when it's switched off you can see more or less through the structure and can provide dazzling immersive effects, like for Portugal's promenade through a park. Eagle eyed viewers will recognise that this is the same technology used back in 2007's contest with a massive part transparent LED structure. This LED structure and a massive LED wall make just two of the four massive video canvases, the other two being on both floors of the main and B stages. Speaking of catwalks, this little bit had me geeked out. At the front of the main stage there's a camera track for those ultra low close ups, but the spot for the catwalk is also in the way of this camera track. How can this weird conundrum be remedied? Simple. Hidden under the stage is crew member Chris, who controls whether the catwalk is connected or not. By a little screen, he doesn't see much else show-wise, so what a great way to brighten up his little den by bringing a disco light. Very Eurovision, but also very cool. Original plans would have seen the area surrounding the stage filled with thousands of adoring fans. But in the name of safety, this was scrapped and provided ample space for the green room to expand for effective social distancing between delegations. This also applies to the general stage design, remaining largely the same. 
but was moved several meters down the arena to allow ample room for effective one-way routes for artists and crew crossing backstage. Among the 1,780 light fixtures, one of the lowest numbers we've actually seen in the Eurovision times is the striking lines of light by the Stylos. 481 of them dotted around and circling the arena, noted for being powered from a laser source, giving powerful beams of light, which further gives the staging a unique look. Now, lighting designers had a challenge to not use all the lights at once for all the performances, such as the case for Iceland. They shouted to us, give us the fucking rainbow, <laughs> and they get it. Or in Italy's case, using absolutely all the pyro, as we can see in some delicate acts, such as France, using all but five fixtures. But we'll get to this. And with cool light fixtures, such as a flower pot and additional heads on drop arms, it really was a challenge for stage and production designers to keep clear sight lines to the stage, keeping them up and out of the way of the height of the set. This also included the array of speakers, where the sound department worked cleverly with the rigging team to ensure powerful, punchy audio was maintained, yet out of sight. Mentioned earlier were the extra production measures needed for performers. A system of managing every performer's microphone and IEM equipment was all organised and very tightly with a system of trusty boxes. Each delegation has a box. In the box was their inner monitors, headsets, earpieces and mic grills and are colour coded for each performer. These never leave the performer and are never shared. 120 of them were grill mic heads and were sourced and each singer has a personal one. This goes on top of the ample cleaning used in between each performance, of which there's a dedicated crew to make sure this is happening. Once they're done, it gets packed up in a box, ready to use for next time. Now, as I remarked in my coverage of the 2019 contest, as much, oh, cheeky link up there, as much of this is an event to experience in the arena, its chief purpose, of course, is this is a television event, so no expense was spared at delivering an absolutely jaw-dropping visual experience. 24 cameras take care of the pictures this year, including some notable cool ones. Two 50-foot long technocranes, the active dolly, which is a two-headed camera set up on a track by Opatek of Ukraine, one of which actually broke during the live show itself, but we'll get to this. The 2D spider cam makes a return amongst the wealth of pedestal and steady cam setups, of which there's two of them, plus a handheld one for that run and gun rough handheld effect as seen with France. Now, three of these cameras are extra special. They're equipped with the ability to actually work in immersive AR, but hold your horses, we'll get to this. Two veterans of steady cam operators are on this year Joe from the Netherlands and Tom from Sweden, who did the same operation for Sweden's Melody Festival in this year. This means in addition to running around all the entries this year, he's done Sweden's entry approximately 15 times. Props goes to Remco on camera 19 for this incredible performance for the French entry. More than just pointing and shooting, this shows the beautiful relationship between the performer and the camera operator to make their dream a reality. And this fist bump at the end is amazing to see. Love it. All of these cameras and everything else in the arena sends a whopping 130 video signals from the arena to the TOC, the Technical Operations Center, packed with equipment and then some, which then goes from there into the dual OB trucks provided by industry giants NEP and EMG, who made a nice little fuss with an exciting convoy en route to the arena. And yet, two OB trucks running in a main and backup operation. Everything is absolutely redundant in this contest, which means if something goes wrong, everything can be switched over to the other one, just like that. If Rotterdam were ever to run out of power, the Technical Operations Center could keep the show running for another seven minutes. Check out Samia here from Aerotross's All Access series, as she does a redundancy test with the audio. We gaan we in three, twee, één, and we zijn over op de reserve set. Moet je ook die andere doen, hè? Three, two, one, hop, okay. Where everything switch seemingly switches to redundancy with no discernible blips on air. Controlling all these visuals in the teddy box, it's Qpilot here once again to help deliver some incredible camera direction that may be too fast for us humans to even do by ourselves. This time code based system also drives lighting, pyro and automation so every asset of the show sings from the same sheet. No pun intended. Each camera operator, assistant and relevant crew member has an iPad attached to their camera with their camera cues counting down in real time to let them know when they're on. And with the system, you get some great visuals such as this from Lithuania, Switzerland, and Finland, who has the most camera cuts in this performance. In fact, with over 100 cues, it averages out about one shot for every 1.8 seconds. Fast. Directing the show is a trio featuring Dutchman Marnix Kart, who takes care of semi final one, the grand final, and the look and the feel of the show itself. Daniel Jelinek, who takes care of semi final two and contributes some direction to the final and Mark Poss, who takes care of the interval acts and works with Marnix on the camera tech planning. 
three musketeers. In fact, Marnix has a particularly special link with Eurovision, as his wife, believe it or not, was actually one of the performers in 1986's Netherlands entry. She's one of the frizzle sizzles. If blowing your visual socks off was an Olympic sport, then the Dutch would very easily clinch gold, as augmented reality, AR, makes a huge return this year to jaw-dropping results. Like, it seems to deliver some great detail for the song titles, with the lights reflecting along the ceiling and reflections on the stage floor. That little detail I absolutely love. But it's using grand scale with Duncan Lawrence's intro in semi-final one, the power of water, which plunged the Ahoy directly under the waves with its cool water and wave effect. This incredible, awe-inspiring flag parade. Here there was even a connection with the media servers to control the intensity of the LED screens and even use the lights around the LED screens to make things even more lifelike. And of course, this is a very nice reference to Iceland actually not being in the arena themselves with drawings from the live shows, but remembering them as they're there all the same. And if that wasn't enough, Check this out. AR is used to bridge the connection, <laughs> quite literally, during the interval act by literally bringing the famous Erasmus Bridge into the arena. And look at that. This is all generated and tracked in real time. So as the camera moves and tracks and tilts and pans, it does so with the graphics. Honestly, this bridge shot featuring the rest of Rotterdam and just a composited LED structure in the background is absolutely mind blowing. Wow. Don't give it up, land. Fantastic. All of this took an astonishing 18 months of design and development, readying it for broadcast, provided by content designers Gravity and the camera tech providers NEP. As mentioned earlier, three cameras are equipped to do all of this real-time magic. Camera 7, which is a massive 50-foot crane on stage right, camera 8, which runs on a track in the green room area, and camera 18, the one-dimensional camera on a rail that's also used for the song title shot. These cameras are digitally controlled and sends back its data from position, extension, head roll, and yo to the AR system for tracking. And all of this uses hundreds of markers dotted around the arena on the floor and in the trusses around the stage. Now, with all the joys of live TV and an otherwise near flawless show, something actually happened with one of these cameras. Cameras 5 and 15 of the Active Dolly, which featured these cool babies, manufactured especially for Eurovision. Back in semi-final one, around the third song, one of these cameras was very unfortunately broke, and it transpired it was absolutely out of use for the rest of the evening. Here, as director Marnus Kart explains. Um, they told me, okay, the, the camera's broken for the whole evening. I dived directly in the queue pilot to, to the other countries, and watch to camera fire, what he's doing, when, what, and, and then we changed uh, the cameras really during the live show from camera five to other cameras. Luckily, everything went, uh, on, fell on the good side with the coin. This mainly affected the Irish entry, unfortunately, which didn't have too much of an effect, but this meant that Chantal had to fill live on air whilst they actually found out what the root of the problem was. We're going to keep you on the edge of your seats for just a bit longer. But thanks to its Siamese twin and the quick editable changes over the postcards and cue pilot, Camera 15 was able to take the majority of Camera 5's shots. The show was back on the road. <sighs> now here's the fun part. As if talking about all this wasn't fun enough, I am having an absolute whale of a time, you have no idea. It's the creative side of all the performances. Now before we rattle through them all, this show could not be made possible without the true heroes of Eurovision, the hero vision, the heroes of Eurovision, the incredible army of stagehands. These are the true lifesavers of Eurovision, and this year in particular, as well as scrambling on at top speed to remove and set performances in about 35 seconds, they really helped to make some magical performances happen. From scrambling to add a staircase for Malta, mid-song, to hiding in the cliff for Bulgaria's entry, which very smoothly pivoted Victoria on the stage floor in real time, to Greece. Now this one is impressive. Now instead of ample VR to real-time projection of Russia from 2016, we go back to the old school using trusty green screen. Mid-song, two steady cans give her an alternative view as she does her thing. Meanwhile, a hardy crew rush in on stage just behind the camera operators with perfect green to key staircase and walls, along with the backing dancers just behind them. This whole operation to set, which takes a worrying 10 seconds mid-song, is just enough time to turn the whole stage green for the performance. As quick as they come, they quickly dash out masked by another very clever Steadicam angle and enough to have our dancers morph from green to the usual colour of pink. The stagehands also make their mark again here with the Swiss entry who actually have stagehands on stage with Jean's tears waiting for this to happen. 
Now if you look really closely at the Swiss entry from this angle, you'll notice these markings on the floor. Not visible to viewers, but particularly useful for the changeover during the Swiss performance. This is all under the control of this year's stage marker and technical draftsman, Marcel Velikoup. He makes it easy for the stagehands to place the various things during the show, and while there, is even able to call the shots on his iPad. A far cry from sticky duct tape and even lasers in previous years. He's also the guy in the orange who first sets foot in the arena to carry out the first set of stage markings, so he's a bit of a celebrity in his own right. Pretty cool. Anyway, Rocket Creativity Round! Big props! Spain with a real big moon, not CGI, we're talking a literal real moon that goes from floppy to filled in 16 seconds. The United Kingdom, bring on the trumpets. Bulgaria, featuring real sand. Norway with a real fallen angel and lots of demons and lots of chains. And Ireland with a very creative scrapbook performance. This of course is the one that was affected by the break in Camera 5, which I don't really see too much of an issue with, but I think it's one of the more creative performances on the night. And of all people, Flowrider. Big Pyro. Finland. Italy. Cyprus. Italy. A handful of other countries with a necessary fire and golden shower. Oh yeah, and I forgot. Italy. Using the stage. Netherlands, Israel and Croatia using the B stage for a good portion of the song. In fact, Croatia here using it more or less for their entire performance. This great use of the vanished catwalk screen used by Portugal as it goes from transparent to revealing a promenade through the park at sunset. Along with Iceland, along with their massive pixel perfect choir too. I think I can see myself in there. What's also really cool about this performance is the song is only 2 minutes 45 seconds long. So, the minute they stop singing, they have 15 seconds of You got this, Travis! Pausing and holding it. Make them wait for it! And then BOOM! Give them the pyro at the end. Creative camera. Finland with over 100 shots in Q-Pilot. Lithuania with these really cool cuts and a fantastic way to open the first semi-final, welcoming everyone back to Eurovision. And Switzerland giving you a very intimate music video feel. You kind of forget that you're actually in a performance in an arena with thousands of people watching. And from the big and the loud to the beautifully and delicately minimal. With over 1,700 light fixtures to choose from, France welcomes you in with this beautiful chanteuse using just five fixtures. Of all the performances on the night, the cinematography of this is my absolute favourite. Especially this last frame, ending her voila, to protect who's behind, and almost to surrender with a face dead centre in the middle of the frame, just a little bit higher, just giving a bit of vulnerability and a bit of connection with her, which I absolutely love. Merci. And this best bit is mentioned earlier, the successful fist bump. And we can't forget all of this year's creative performances without mentioning a key pillar of this year's Eurovision, live on tape. If Eurovision being back wasn't enough, it was announced that a special showcase broadcasting the country's live on tape performances will be shown in the week after the final. And it's really interesting noting the differences in style of shooting performances that each of the countries went to. Australia were the first to use this rule due to travel restrictions, but they delivered a stunning colourful, if not tender colourful, performance filmed on location in Sydney, Australia. While some countries use a variation of their national final performance and something a bit more simpler in some cases, take Lithuania, as they created their own life-size version of their stage to perform on. A great way for competitive advantage, as it was also used by Germany. Belgium goes big, but at the very end of the performance, revealing the hall they created their otherwise intimate setup, which is the same hall when Belgium hosted the contest in 1987. Of course, these were to be used as absolute backups in the event that they couldn't make it to the Ahoy. And of course, whilst they were there, this meant that their backup performance would be one of their best performances in the rehearsals leading up to the main show. Now, before we go, here are some of my Fliss faves. Zero points. This I couldn't squeeze in the ass in the show, but the absolutely nut voting procedure. I mean, four countries leaving with no poids? Now, this could only mean one of two things, that the scoreboard was broken and everyone's going to go home with absolutely nothing. Or, the top countries received a very tightly spread amount of the points, which we ended up seeing at the very end of the show. But man, insane. The Portuguese entry, which started in 4x3, 
But as it got to widescreen, even the little song mark at the very end moves along with the margins, which is pretty cool. Tix and all the artists have an absolutely incredible time in the green room, which after many months, or in some cases years of performing and preparing, this was a perfect time to relax and have a bit of fun. The absolute need to hear our 12 points go to Ya Ya Ding Dong! Play it! Because, yeah, and I agree, it, that definitely would have got 12 points. Yeah, definitely. Besides Glorious, incredible, jaw-dropping, augmented reality, the use of the vanished catwalk screen, and the perfect ending sequence, the winners coming through the centre doors. Usually this part of the show ends up being quite messy, but this was choreographed to perfection, which I absolutely loved. Of which I actually have a video about my previous favourite ones up here. Take a little look-see. Deuce Jongens, that is it. That is a little deep dive into the makings of the biggest television show in the world, the Eurovision Song Contest. And after many years of preparation, it's great to see how jaw-droppingly amazing it really is. For a show this big, there's so much more that could be covered. But I hope you enjoyed my little whistle stop tour into this immense production, this labyrinth of a production. What were your favourite parts of the show? What made you go absolutely nuts at the TV like this crazy dude? Oh, you oh called it! You I called it! it. You, called it. it. you called it! You called it! Flashback. Question, who's gonna win? It's a tough one. It's gonna be hard. I'm gonna put my money on. Italy. Oh. Wow, okay. Yeah, watch, one big to watch. Big words, big words. End of flashback. Yeah, you called it. You called it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, mission expert. What did you not love? What did you not feel hate for? <laughs> Sorry. And were you even just glad there's an incredible showcase was back on your screens? Let me know in the comments section below. If you liked what you saw, give us a like and hit that big red subscribe button. And of course, my previous episodes are here to enjoy. Until next time people, always remember to hit record and stay live. Peace.